That was Garth from Wayne's World, and it's not, but welcome back to the Wild Business Growth Podcast presented by Hippo Direct. This is your place to hear from a new entrepreneur or innovator every single Wednesday morning who's turning wild ideas into wild growth. I'm your host, Max Brandstetter, digital marketing due to Hippo Direct, and you can email me at max at hippodirect.com for help using your podcast as a marketing tool. This is episode number 91, and today's guest is Carter McLean, aka Carter Mack. Carter is one of the most talented and impressive drummers you will ever hear from, and he has the seat as the drummer of The Lion King on Broadway. In addition to that, he's toured with the eight-string guitar legend Charlie Hunter and has performed with the bandmates of everyone from James Brown to Prince to Peter Gabriel. He also offers educational drumming videos and private Skype lessons through his site, fourhandsdrumming.com. In this interview, we dive into how he became such an amazing drummer, how he's been able to build his brand in person and in the online world, and his thoughts on creativity. It's Carter, the man who can provide his own drum roll. Enjoy the show. Alrighty, we are here with Carter McLean, aka Carter Mack, one of the most amazing drummers you will ever come across. The man with four hands and probably... 17 legs and 14 feet as well. How are you doing today, Carter? I'm good, Max. How are you doing, man? <laughs> doing, doing great. I start off every episode that way. But uh, <laughs> this is really cool. I've been connected for a while. And actually, I was introduced to you by a previous guest, Mitch Zlotnick from Audimute, who I know hooked up your studio with some of their sound absorption and, and soundproofing technology. So uh, before we get started, just want to shout out to Mitch, who is a mutual friend to both of us and, and just an all around cool dude. Oh yeah, Mitch is a a world class human being and really bright guy, really funny guy. I kind of reached out to him a long time, well, a couple of years ago, and wanted to try to start a relationship because I I bought some of his previous products and really really thought they were an amazing value for what they did. And I was building out a new studio that was a much bigger space and reached out to him. And turns out he was a dr- or he is a drummer, which was completely random coincidence. <laughs> um, and we just kind of struck up a friendship and he ended up flying out here and staying at my house for the weekend. And we installed all the stuff in the studio and it, it turned out just to be an unbelievable space. And a lot of that's just due to him and, and his products. And, you know, he's just such a great guy. Yeah. And, and you can, and you can see the amazing work that you guys did. I mean, if you look at your Instagram, Carter Mac, your studio, all the time you can see like you probably don't even know what's soundproofing or, or sound absorption uh, unless you really know Mitch and Audi mute because it's so camouflaged but it's just such a professional look and and I know you guys partnered that way to really create something amazing so so that's cool so I was debating where to start off here because there's so many aspects of your career that I'm fascinated by and I just keep going back to origins and and how you get started so to kick us off today to kick drum us off today there's gonna be a lot of drum puns (laughs) take us to the moment that you knew that your career would be focused on drumming uh yeah that's i that's an interesting question and my answer seems crazy but it's i've thought about this a lot because i get asked a lot when i'm teaching at clinics or something and people say you know when did you really start getting serious as a drummer and you know, I started when I was 10 years old and I, I would literally say when I was 11 or 12, I knew I was going to be, I, or not I was going to be, but I wanted to be a professional drummer. I wanted to be in the music industry. And as you get older, that's a really rare thing to find people at that age to know what they actually want to do and have a passion for and follow through with it. So that, that's a little bit rare, but I just fell in love with music at a young age and for whatever reason, the drums kind of jumped out at me and it seemed like it was something I could wrap my head around. Even before I had a drum set, I remember listening to a Bruce Springsteen song. This must have been 1987 or something, 86. Remember it like it was yesterday. 
Yeah, well, and, you know, those songs are really simple drum parts, but you can hear them very clearly. And I remember going, all right, that's a hi-hat. That's like a snare, I think is what it's called. And this is a like a big bass drum. And I kind of figured out how to play a rock beat just on like a phone book in my leg. And I remember showing my mom going like, hey, check this out. This is so cool. Like, the, I think this is how you play a drum beat. And she was like, yeah, okay, whatever. Like, she kind of like blew it off thinking, you know, crazy young kid. <laughs> and then I started, you know, really asking like, hey, you think I could get like some drums? And she was like, well, if you're serious about it, you can mow lawns all summer and we'll get you like a little teeny drum set. Like, okay, sweet, done. So I was mowing lawns all summer. We got a really cheap beat up mismatched drum set. And I kind of was just off to the races. I was playing to like Rolling Stones tunes, like The Who. I remember Guns N' Roses had just come out with Appetite for Destruction at this point. So that was a huge record. Oh, wow. That was actually the first record I played through from first song to last song and kind of taught myself how to play. Fast forward, I played through high school, played in like jazz band. I went to college for one year for music and absolutely hated it, dropped out. And at that point, I already had some endorsements with some of the bigger drum companies. And I, you know, fast forward, I moved to New York and started playing full time to see if I could, you know, actually hang in a big city. And, you know, then I got the Lion King gig and that's been 18 years. Holy cow. Well, congrats on that. And anybody who's seen the Lion King is obviously knows how big a part of that production music is. And I'm sure we'll dive into that more in a little bit. But sure. uh, back, back to your beginnings congrats on being the first ever phone book drummer so that's pretty cool but <laughs> when you started playing I mean you mentioned you would take these albums and some of these are the most famous rock albums of all time and, and play them from start to finish if you had to guess how many different albums do you think you've played along to in your life oh thousands easily thousands uh, oh yeah I mean it's like it's way more than hundreds it's not millions but it's definitely in the thousands I mean yeah. I don't know it's Growing up as a kid, I play. I, I literally, I remember lining up when CDs came out. I remember buying every Led Zeppelin CD and having them stacked from the first one all the way to the last one. And I would just go through a record, play through it top to bottom. Then I'd put on the next record, play through that. You know, and this might be over like a week or something because I was actually trying to learn the parts of these records. Like I loved the music and I could understand what the drummers were doing. And that's kind of how I learned that if I stumbled upon something I couldn't do, I would loop that song until I could do exactly what they were doing on the album. And it's a great way to learn because you have to use your ears. And as a musician, that's a really important skill is listening. Yeah, it's listening is feels like somewhat of the, the secret sauce behind the, the musical output you have, because you really have to internalize it and, and, and kind of Take, take what you learn, take what you're hearing, and then turn that into what you're actually doing with your arms and legs. That's, that's a good point there. And on these, you know, the millions of albums, no, no, million, millions would be pretty crazy. But when, when you're listening to these thousands of albums, and when you're learning and continuing to grow your passion for drumming, when you think back to, let's go to your teenage years, how many hours a day, or, or how many days a week did you spend drumming? I mean, you know, when I was in junior high school and high school, you have a lot of time. You don't think you do when you're that age. You think, you know, you're so busy, but you're not. Really. Right. You know, once you get out of school and you did your homework, it's like 3.30 or 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And, you know, like I typically go to work at Lion King at 4.30 or 5.30 in the evening. So as a kid, you don't really realize how much free time you have. And I tell that to my students a lot. I tell them, I say, look, I know you don't believe me, but now is the time to be practicing because you will never have this amount of time any other time in your life, basically. And so it's a really important time. And I'm glad my mom was like, you know, lenient enough and could deal with the fact that I'm in the basement at, right after school every day for, I probably play for two or three hours, maybe, maybe two hours a day. Um, and that's like a school week. And then on the weekends, I'd have band practice. My brother's also a great musician. He's a guitar player and singer. His name is Jamie McLean, and he plays, he has his own band called the Jamie McLean Band, and then he plays with Aaron Neville from the Neville Brothers. He played in the Dirty Dozen Brass Band for seven years in New Orleans. Oh, wow. So we, we grew up playing together, and so on the weekends, it was like, you know, he'd be in the house, my buddy would come over and play bass, and we had a band, and so we would rehearse because we were doing gigs at parties and making money. So we, I was always playing every day, and I loved it. It wasn't work at all. 
And it clearly shows in your craft. What were your neighbors' reaction to all this music coming from your house all the time? Uh, I mean, our neighbors were far, you know, we live out in the suburbs of New York City, so our neighbors weren't, you know, right on top of us. So, you know, if they even could hear our band, it would be like a whisper to them, you know. And they, everybody around the neighborhood was cool. They'd always say like, oh, hey, we heard you guys playing Jumping Jack Flash. Sounded great, you know. <laughs> so, you know, I guess if we were like horrible, that would be maybe a different conversation. But I, I remember hearing tapes of us not that long ago when we were kids and I have some video of us playing at some parties when I'm like, I think I'm in sixth grade. My brother is two years older, so he was in eighth grade. And we sound pretty good. I was pretty impressed, actually. I think that's how you know you're good. When, when people hear you from down the street and aren't annoyed by it, and they're actually able to identify the song by it. So that maybe that's the first moment when you're like, hey, I'm pretty good at this. Yeah, and it's fun when you like, you know, your friends in school see, come see your band and they're like, man, that was so cool. Like they, you know. Being in a band is kind of a cool thing when you're a young kid. It's and it's I I did sports a little bit, like I played soccer, I played the cross, but I was never really I was never super into the sports thing. I was kind of a little bit more into like doing my own thing, and music was a way that I could do my own thing whenever I wanted to. You know, I didn't need a team of guys to get together to have a game. I could just always do it whenever I wanted to at home. Yeah, there's such a a level of customization with it. And so I want to get to The Lion King. And this is, I know, is a super impactful movie in my childhood. Um, and, and, and so many, I mean, literally millions of people across the world growing up. And then the Broadway production, you know, speaks to a life of its own. I think I, I saw it in Cleveland. I think I saw it in New York as well when I was younger. But you, you, you are the drummer in the Broadway production of The Lion King, which is a really incredible role you have there. Um, I know you've been doing it for so many years. Did you have a goal in mind that you wanted to be a, a drummer on Broadway or, or did you have any sort of affinity towards the Lion King to begin with? No, not at all. I mean, I think the movie came out in 1995 or six. So I was like a senior a junior or a senior in high school. So I remember it came out and was like, yeah, whatever. Some cartoon about a lion. I'm not going to worry <laughs> about that. It was just kind of a passing thing. And I remember it was really popular, but the Broadway show started, I think, in 97. So I would have been a freshman in college when that opened on Broadway. And honestly, I had never seen a Broadway show. I was never, my radar was not up for that. I wanted to play with, you know, Peter Gabriel or Sting or Paul Simon or someone like that, you know, like a big artist that I really loved their music. You know, and back then, everybody had a band. It wasn't like somebody on stage with a DJ and a bunch of dancers. I mean, right. there was like, everyone knew, okay, Manu Cache is playing with Peter Gabriel on this tour and Tony Levin's on bass. It was like, you know, it was like a bunch of superstars. And it's a little bit sad nowadays that it's a little bit lost, unfortunately, with these younger bands. Like, it's just kind of like a bunch of guys. Nobody really knows who each person is. And, the, you know, they have a cool light show or something, you know? Right. Um, so I was really into that headspace and the way Lion King came about when I was, I think I was still in high school, actually, when I got this endorsement, there was a company, a really big drum company. It's one of the bigger drum companies out there. And uh, they approached me at a trade show called NAM, it stands for National Association of Music Merchants. And it's in LA every year. It's a big trade show for all the music companies. And I sat down at one of their drum sets just to listen to it, just to check it out. And the president, you know, long story short, the president of the company came over, heard me playing and said, who are you? You sound amazing. I want to give you a full endorsement right now. I mean, it was like a total out of a movie. It was crazy. Yeah. And so I was kind of freaking out and I gave him the information, long story short. That was when I was living in Colorado, when I was going to school out there for that year. But when I moved to New York, that drum company said, hey, there's this guy who plays drums on The Lion King. He might be somebody. He's also one of our artists with this drum company, it might be a good connection for you just so you know somebody in the city. And I was like, yeah, that's cool. I'm not really into Broadway, but I'll take his number. And so I didn't call him for like a year. The first year I was in New York, I toured with this guy, Melvin Sparks, who was a pretty well-known soul jazz gu guitar player, played with, had his own career, but also played with James Brown and a bunch of people. And so I was touring with him for a year. And then the way I kind of snuck onto the Broadway scene was, someone else had called me to read a, a this is right before 9-11 happened 
I think this was in May of, of 2001, May or June, uh, somebody called me to do a uh, reading of an off-Broadway show they were putting together. It was going to be called Raise the Roof. And I had no idea what, what I should be getting paid for this in New York City. I just had no clue what the scale was kind of, you know, the average pay was. So I was like, oh, yeah, I have this guy's number who plays a Lion King. I'll give him a buzz and just ask him, do, do these numbers make sense for this kind of work? And I called him and just said, hey, I got your number from so-and-so at this company. You know, can I ask you a couple questions just about finance within the city? And he said, sure, yeah, th th those numbers sound fine. And then he said, you know, they told me about you. You're supposed to be a great player. If that show doesn't work out, I'd love to have you come by and learn the drum book at Lion King as a sub. And I think I was 21 or 22 at the time. Oh, my God. And I was like, yeah, that sounds cool. And I didn't really think much of it. I was like, oh, yeah, I think that's a pretty big show. I know Disney runs it. And I went in, long story, short, try to make these short. These are long stories that could go on for two hours. But <laughs> Hey, we love long stories. <laughs> I got a million of them. So uh, basically, I, I learned the book. He gave me the music. I sat in the pit a few times, watched the show. And then he said, okay, you sound good, man. Uh, you can play Thursday night. And then you basically go in. You don't rehearse with the orchestra. And you just do the show. And you hope you have it memorized. And you hope you do a good job. Because you really only get one shot. The conductor's like on top of you the whole time. You know, everybody makes a bunch of mistakes. I made a ton of little mistakes. But you know, the conductor came down after the show and said, look, there's a couple little things you missed, but that's totally normal. There's a million little pitfalls in these shows. But he said, overall, you sounded fantastic. You know, you can keep coming back. And I was like, great. So I was, I was one of the main subs on that show for 10 years. And then eight or nine years ago, I forget what it is now, eight or nine years ago, I took over the show permanently. The other drummer left and they asked me to take over. Holy cow. So it, it all started with a more or less audition in that standpoint. Well, congrats. I mean, you're nearing a decade of this now. So, so congrats. And, and one of the, I, I don't know what the rankings are, but I know it's one of the most recognizable shows in the world. Oh yeah. You mentioned the pit, which I've always been curious about because I think theater shows, Broadway shows do such a good job of making the music an essential part of the show, but also keeping the orchestra and all the musicians out of sight for the most part. What's that like when you're in the pit? Well, every pit's different, but Lion King's orchestra is like 27 people or something. It's pretty big. So, you know, if you picture sitting in the audience at a theater at a Broadway show that you can usually see the conductor at the front center of the stage, you can see about half of him, his torso, basically swinging his arms conducting. <laughs> so if you picture, if you go down about one, you know, I don't know, 10 feet below him, there's a whole flat area that's called the pit, basically the orchestra pit. And that's where all the string players are, the piano player, the bass player, you know, the percussionists, the flute players, everybody are down there. And so the drummer is usually somewhere down there or sometimes because they're loud, they're off in another part of the building isolated, which is kind of crazy. But at Lion King, the drum set book is such an important part of the show that they built a soundproof plexiglass room, a separate room within that pit. So I have my own door that I go in that I close and I'm kind of in, you know, a fish tank, basically. It's the top <laughs> half is a plexiglass. And then the bottom, bottom of the walls are all soundproof. Um, so the way the orchestra is set up, the drums are in the middle. And then just to the right of me is the whole string section. So if that room wasn't built and I was playing full on loud drums, the string players would just get blown away with volume. I was going to say they might literally get blown away. Yeah, because there's a couple parts of the show where I'm hitting really hard. I mean, they're like really big pop songs. You know, they're Elton John tunes, so I'm hitting hard. Yeah. So that's, it's actually kind of great because I can just go in, close my door. I've got my little, you know, mini fridge with iced tea and coffee and stuff. And I just kind of put in my headphones, play the show, and I take off. It's, it's kind of nice. It's the Lion King bachelor pad. That, You're rocking it. Some people have come to visit. I mean, Mitch checked it out and he's like, man, this is bigger than some people's apartments in New York. And I was like, this is actually bigger than my first room in New York City when I was living here, which is kind of crazy. <laughs> I was going to say, especially in New York. Oh, yeah. So Lion King is interesting for you because uh, you do so much studio work and also touring. Like you've done so much where, where you've written and performed your own music. And so with that stuff, I'm sure it's really kind of internalized everything. But with Lion King, you know, these are the songs were existing already. And so you're making sure i mean you mentioned before like you try to memorize everything and try to get as many notes right as you can 
How do you get yourself in the mindset to have the best Lion King performance each and every night? Like, how do you, how do you get yourself into the spirit and kind of the vibes of that show since, since it is so specific? Well, I mean, I figured out I've done over 4,000 of those shows, which is a lot. So yeah. you've got to find ways to make it to stay interested. You know, it's very easy. And I see some people some nights go in and they're just kind of, you know, barely calling it in. You know, they're, they're just doing the bare minimum. They're tired or they're sick of it or whatever. I have two kind of perspectives. One, as a musician, you have to remind yourself how lucky you are to have a gig like that. Because there's, you know, when I took over that book, I had probably, I'm not joking, 50 to 75 guys, drummers in New York, email me and say, A, congratulations, and B, can I start subbing for you? Because it's a very coveted wow. gig, you know? So I always kind of remind myself, like, look, even though I might not be stoked to play Hakuna Matata tonight for the 4,100th time, <laughs> I do have to play it like my, you know, basically like it's the last night of, of the show because whoever's in the audience that night, it's their first time probably seeing the show. And I want to give them the same experience that I did the first month I was playing the show when I was super fired up and excited to play, you know, tickets are expensive. You want to do the best job you can. Otherwise don't take the job. That's how I look at that. And as far as a musical standpoint, there's always things to work on. It's actually a pretty difficult drum set book. There's a lot of different styles you have to play with a lot of different in implements, mallets, brushes, hand drums, drumsticks, shakers, electronic drums. There's a lot of different things going on that you have to be fluent with. So I might, I might go in one night and be like, man, I'm really tired. I'm going to work on my posture and my breathing during the show for the whole show and, and focus on sitting up straight, breathing slowly, relaxing, playing with good technique. Or some nights I'll just be like, you know, I'm going to listen to the bass player really intently all night and try to lock with him as hard as I can. There's always stuff to work on, or I'm going to follow the conductor a certain way tonight, or I'm going to pay attention to what the dancers are doing more. Or, you know, there's a lot going on. That's fascinating that you kind of can pick and choose based on each night what you're going to focus on. And I, I guess doing something over 4,000 times, you, you develop a knack for that, of, of which parts you can kind of isolate mentally. And then what would you say is the biggest thing you've learned from drumming in a, a setting like a theater setting and how different is that from touring or studio work that's a great question so playing on broadway or or let's just say playing with a conductor it could be an orchestra anytime you're working with a conductor typically as the drummer whether if you're in a jazz band a rock band a pop band whatever it is you're kind of driving the boat you're leading the pulse you're counting off the the songs you're kind of in charge when you start working with a conductor or work on a Broadway show, you kind of drop down. You know, when I took over the gig, they kind of said this. The conductor came to me and said, look, I'm the captain of the ship, okay? But you're driving the boat. So you have to watch me and do what I say, but you're actually steering the boat. So it's a big deal. And it's a good analogy because I'm watching him like a hawk the whole show because he's giving you downbeats for songs. He's giving you tempos, little cues with dancers. And learning how to read a conductor, how they move and how they move their arms and, and dictate the time is an art in itself. And there's five different conductors, depending on what night of the week it is. So I have to learn five different people's approach to how they conduct the show. They're all different. They're subtle, but they're different. So that's, I would say, the biggest difference is you really having to follow someone else that's telling you what they want you to do as opposed to you just counting off a tune, one, two, three, bat, boom, boom, bat, right? In a regular gig, that's your gig. But on a Broadway show, you're kind of the second man in line at that point, if that makes sense. Yeah, and if you are attending The Lion King in person, now you know that there's five different torsos that you can look at if you keep your eye out. Yeah, well, no, depending on the night, it's like if the main conductor is out or he's like got to go deal with something, there'll be the assistant conductor will be in. And if that assistant conductor is not in, It'll be someone else. So there's only just one conductor a, a night. Imagine you started your own podcast. You're growing your brand, sharing your expertise, maybe even your terrible puns, and meeting fascinating people. That is awesome. Now, imagine all the hours you've lost every week 
due to the podcast's demands. Not so awesome. I am your podcast producer. Email me at max at hippodirect.com. So that's a good kind of, we'll call it a contrasting segue because that is very much in person and with you performing in person. And another part of your brand that you've created and what you do in your day-to-day life that is so impressive is how much you do from an online standpoint and a in virtual standpoint. And so, you know, anybody that checks out your brand, you know, Carter Mack or Carter McLean on Instagram or YouTube will see all the videos, all the content you put out and how much of that you're teaching as well. And I know you do Skype lessons, you do a lot of virtual things. I mean, I remember pretty soon after I followed your account, I noticed that you were very active doing Instagram lives. And I thought it was so cool because not only do you drum while you're on Instagram live, but you'll literally be sitting there in the seat and position your phone looking at the snare drum or looking at the different symbols. And it really feels like you as the viewer are drumming. And so that's really, I think you've got one of the coolest approaches to Instagram live I've seen. Oh, thanks. Yeah, yeah, of course. So when did it kind of click for you that in addition to making an income on Broadway, you could also actually coach and teach people and and do things virtually from a drumming standpoint? Yeah, that came pretty organically. I think it's just because of the technology and the times we're in. I mean, I've been teaching since I was, you know, I, I I was teaching even when I was like 17 or 18, which is crazy to think about. But my technique and stuff got really good, you know, pretty quickly at a young age. So even older drummers would say, Hey man, can you show me how to do this? I'd love to get a lesson with you. And I would just explain like, this is how I taught myself and this is what I think about. So I've always been teaching, but those were typically, you know, this is pre cell phone, right? This is like, you know, 1990. Which sounds like world war one era. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. People are like, wait, there was something before the internet. Yeah. This was pre internet. People would call your home phone number and book a lesson and come to your house and take a lesson. So as technology changed and YouTube became a thing and online drum lessons became a thing, I was, you know, I, I wasn't, people would search me out if they had a question or wanted a lesson. I wasn't like promoting, Hey, I'm a big, you know, teacher. That's my thing. I was, you know, that wasn't how I was looking at it, but enough people kept talking to me. I was like, Oh, maybe I should say like, Hey, I do teach on the side if anybody wants lessons. And I did like a couple online things for some other companies Uh, And a lot of people watched them. And then I started my own YouTube channel. And my YouTube channel is not really an educational space. It's more, here's a 1941 Ludwig Duco snare drum. Let's see what it sounds like. And and I don't even talk. I just type that and I'll just play the drum, post it. There's no talking. I don't say anything in the videos. It's just check out the video. If you like it, cool. If you don't, that's cool too. You talk with your hands and feet. Yeah, exactly. And then I started realizing people kept asking me the same questions over and over. How do you tune your drums the way you do? How do I get my hand speed as as fast and as clean as you do? How do I approach playing grooves? It was like this group of like 10 to 15 questions that I got over and over and over. And instead of just answering them all the time, I decided to make my own educational website called Four Hands Drumming. And, you know, there was a year in between where I took over at Lion King And when I was touring that I kind of just decided to stop playing drums because it was the music industry is just, it's a difficult industry. Even if you're one of the best musicians on the planet, it's still very difficult. I think people have this illusion that just because you're in a big famous band, you're a millionaire. That is absolutely not the case. Yeah. And, And you'd be shocked at what some huge quote unquote bands, you know, drummer or singer or whatever, they actually pull home at the end of the year financially. It's it's a lot less than you think, even though they look like they're making a ton of money, they're not in most cases. If you're in the Rolling Stones, that's a different scenario. I mean, who isn't in the Rolling Stones though? Yeah, that's true. <laughs> you know, everybody, but uh, uh, just just not me. I'm the only one not in the Rolling Stones. Yeah, get it. <laughs> yeah, come on. Get a jump on the bandwagon, boat. Carter. I'm, it's really unfortunate for me. It's great for everyone else. But um, <laughs> so... I started doing this four hands drumming site because I had all this camera gear because I took some time off from playing drums for about a year and I started a photography business. I was always into shooting when I was on tour. I bought a a nice DSLR Canon camera the first time I went on tour in Europe for a a month 
And I just started taking photographs in all the towns I was in. And when I got home, I was showing them to friends and stuff. And they were saying, man, these are beautiful photos. Like I would buy a print. If you framed that and printed it, I would buy that from you. And I was like, oh, okay. So I started selling prints to friends. I did an art show in New York City, um, sold out of all of those. I entered a couple just like off the cuff, um, maybe it was Smithsonian Institute uh, photo competition. And two of my photos made it into the top three of that contest and they featured it. No in way. Like, yeah, they featured two of the photos in a documentary they did online on PBS and it was pretty cool. So I was like, oh my God. Well, maybe I should do photography because I can work for myself. I don't need to wait for some singer or some band to take me out on the road. Like, I know I can play drums, but that's part of the equation. The other part is marketing yourself to the other musicians out there to hire you. And if they're not calling, you can't just go out and do a drum solo tour or most, you know, most people can, I wouldn't want to go do that. <laughs> and so you try it. I could try it. But so long, again, long story short, I could talk for another two hours about photography, but I was working with some great people that were letting me intern with them in the city. This guy, Chase Jarvis, who's an amazing photographer. He happened to be in New oh, yeah. York. He's a, yeah, he's a huge name. Yeah, he's great. He lives on the West Coast, but he just happened to be in New York for a month at the Ace Hotel doing an installation. And he's, he was looking for people to help him. And in exchange, he would review your portfolio and give you some advice. And I was like, man, that's great. I'm totally going to go do that. So the way I started, you know, transitioning back, I got called by Lion King after I started my photography company and I was doing really <laughs> of well. Course. Lion King calls all of a sudden and says, hey, would you like to take over the show? And I'm like, okay, I guess I'm going to put photography on hold. But the nice thing is Instagram and anything online or any video classes, you need to kind of know how to use a camera and know how to take a decent photo. So I already knew how to do that. So I had all the gear and I said, you know, I have a Pro Tools rig so I can record the audio. Maybe I'll just do these classes and I'll do an hour class on tuning. I'll do an hour on, you know, technique, an hour interview with the bass player at Lion King, Tom Barney, who's like played with Miles Davis, Elton John, Sinatra, Whitney Houston, Michael Jackson. Wow. Okay. That's, that's an okay lineup. Yeah. Like, you know, I'm interviewing like real musicians on the site, right? So other drummers can gain knowledge from them. And so that's been up running for three and a half years now. And it's been great. People have really gotten a lot out of it. So that's my kind of education side of, of video, of having kind of an educational online thing. But Instagram to me is just like more of a fun, you know, here's a little groove I'm working on, or here's a really cool old drum set. I'm not trying to sell anything to anybody. It's more just sharing information with the drumming community. Right. It's interesting that you don't think of it as much as like a, a business driver, a revenue standpoint. It's just something you're at, something you have fun in and you can create so many ideas for, for videos and, and stuff that people would find interesting. What would you say is the number one way that you've been able to grow and build your personal brand, whether it be Instagram or YouTube or through your four hands drumming site, what can you point to that has fueled that growth? That's a great question. And I've, I've thought about it a lot because when I first started my Instagram, I was posting like, you know, landscape photography pictures. You know, there were nice photos, but. Maybe you know, put like a snare drum in the background or something. No, I never even did that. It was all just like, oh, here's a really cool landscape shot I took when I was in Ireland or something. And then I'm also a really big collector of like scotch and bourbon, right? Ooh, that's a fun collection. Yeah, I probably have 200 bottles of really rare scotch and bourbon in my house. My wife and I kind of share that love. So we, you know, we amassed all these bottles over the years and I would be taking photos of like a super rare, you know, 23 year Talisker or something. And then, you know, all the bourbon freaks were like, oh my God, that's amazing. Yeah. Oh, that's, I'm a bourbon freak now, I guess. Oh. <laughs> so it was funny because, you know, I was a full-time musician, but I wasn't really posting anything about drums. And uh, when we moved out to my house out here, um, that was about 10 years ago, I realized, oh, like I can set up a drum set and like record myself. And so I, I and this was right when you could start uh, posting video on Instagram for a while, it was just photos. And it was only, I think it was 15 seconds that you could post. It was really short or maybe it was 30 seconds, but it was, it wasn't a minute. And I remember just posting like a groove or something on Instagram. And all of a sudden I went from like 
I don't know, 150 followers to like 4,000 in like two days or something. And I was like, man, people really digging the drum thing. This is weird. And I didn't think much about it. And then people were just, you know, messaging me like, who are you? Like, you know, post more stuff about drums. Like nobody cares about bourbon. I'm like, oh, okay. So I kind of realized like, all right, the drumming community wants to see this stuff. And then I just decided I'm just going to post drum related stuff, whether it's photos or videos or little tips. And then it just started to grow. I remember when I hit 10,000, I was like, holy moly, like, 10,000 people following me. This is weird. And then one morning I woke up and had a little blue check next to my name a long time ago. And people are like, man, you got, I think it's called verified or something. I was like, yeah, I don't know how that happened, but I don't know what it means. They're like, you know, it means you're, you're legit. And I'm like, okay, well, I feel the same as I did yesterday when I wasn't quote unquote legit. So you're telling me it didn't like transform your life. And then it was instantly like MTV no. Cribs mansion overnight. No, caviar was not raining down into my house. Like, it was oh, not. that's what I heard. Some maybe for some people, not for me though. Yeah, it depends. But, uh, I guess on the weather condition. Yeah, but, <laughs> cloudy with a chance of caviar. There we go. The new the new book with yeah. music by Carter McLean. And just one more question on this area. So you do tons of teaching and, and educating from a. You have the online class and you do Skype lessons as well. What advice do you have for, you know, as the world gets more and more virtual, what advice do you have for teaching something or really doing business in a, in a virtual sense, as opposed to, as you said, you know, quote unquote, the old days where you're actually doing lessons right with somebody or, or, or you're working face to face with somebody? It's a great question. So for me, and, I, and this kind of ties back to the, like the growth I had on social media, it was totally organic. And I didn't even know people were like, you know, you can buy followers if you want. And I'm like, what, what does that mean? Like <laughs> you can purchase people that are robots or something to show that it looks like you're, it's like a popularity contest that you can buy. It was very strange to find that out. But I mean, honestly, I kind of stopped caring about the number of people following. I'd rather have 10,000 people following me that really care about what I'm doing than, you know, a hundred thousand that are just kind of random people that don't really care what you're up to. Cause at that point it's just kind of a little bit empty. But I think a big thing that people like about my page or following me is that I'm very honest. There's no, I'm not a car salesman. You know, I, I don't, in my YouTube video, I don't go like, you know, hit subscribe and follow this. And, that, and I understand you have to do that. Right. I get that. But to me personally, it feels odd for me to say that. So I just leave all of that stuff out and I leave it up to whoever's tuning in. I kind of let my content dictate if somebody wants to follow me or not. If I have to sell it really, really hard, I feel like maybe my content should be speaking louder than my pitch, you know, to get people to follow me. So just being honest and transparent, I think is a really smart way to lead really any business. And try to respond to people. You know, I get questions all day long on my Instagram and, and email and whatever. And I really try to sit down and give a thoughtful answer to everybody. If I don't have time, I don't have time. But, you know, I really do try to follow up with that stuff. Well, it's a great approach. And I like what you said about having your content speak for itself. But I do want to say I would buy a car from you any day, Carter. So you got, you got that handled as well. <laughs> Well, maybe I'm in the wrong industry. Maybe I could really be selling some BMWs or something to some folks, make some good money. I think so. As long as it's raining caviar. That's right. Let's switch gears a little bit. You are inherently creative. So I want to get to a segment on inspiration and, and creativity. So on the inspiration side, or I guess on the drumming side, on the drumming inspiration side, who is your absolute biggest inspiration in the drumming world? It's an impossible question that I get almost every day. It's like picking your favorite sibling or your favorite family member or something. It's very, it's hard. <laughs> and it changes for me. You know, I go through phases where, I mean, I could list names like, you know, I could list like my top 10 that I've always had is Tony Williams, Elvin Jones, Max Roach, you know, Jeff Watts, Jack DeJanet, John Bonham, Brian Blade, Bill Stewart. I mean, I could go on and on. There's just I was going to say, you have that clearly prepared. You have the list. You have a list in your pocket you carry around all the time. Basically, it's actually tattooed on my forearm. So if you're ever around. <laughs> that explains um, a lot. 
I can just hold up my forearm and I don't need to speak anymore. But there we go. It's honestly every, every pretty much every drummer I have ever heard or every musician I've ever heard is an influence. It, it, it has to be, you know, there's obviously people you gravitate more towards, but you know, I'm, I would say this, if people are unfamiliar with who John Bonham is, he's the drummer from Led Zeppelin. So I know you've probably heard his playing and yeah. he's got a very distinct sound and it's a very big infectious drum sound. So like, go check him out. If you're not familiar who Tony Williams is, he was Miles Davis's drummer when uh, Tony was 17 years old and it was called the Miles Davis Quintet. He unfortunately passed away He was when he was 51. So he was really young, but he played a ton of drums since he was a kid. He's just an absolute monster, monster drummer. And then there's just like, you know, most of my friends are some of my favorite drummers. Like a lot of guys that are my age or even younger that I'm really good buddies with, they're some of my favorite players now because they're all doing really creative stuff. Well, it's cool you take that approach of, I think listening comes up again. Like you're clearly such a good listener and, and you, it doesn't matter if somebody's older than you or younger than you, they're putting out good stuff, then it might be worth you checking out. And that's what's so cool about drumming and the music world in general is some of your biggest inspirations might be from 50, 60, 70 years ago, but we still, and there's you know more and more ability to to access that stuff and listen to it whenever we want. So that's that's definitely an awesome. I'm not even going to call it a trend, but a uh, that's definitely awesome that that has happened. <laughs> How about on the creativity side? So what do you do to? I'm not going to let you say photography because you already said that. But what do you do to to stay creative? And what do you do that you think helps you come up with these crazy innovative and skilled? drum beats but also just the the videos and everything you put out in general that's a good question so it's kind of a two-part thing because it's a visual thing which i love photography so I've, I, you know i'm just and i'm also i try to surround myself like when i built this studio i had a very specific idea in mind and aesthetic and you know like mitch really helped me realize that with designing it he said oh well you know Maybe we'll do this wall like this. I'll send you a CAD design drawing so you can really see what it'll feel like in the room. And uh, I wanted to surround myself in a nice room that was that was kind of calm and clean, but also had a, a lot of nice texture and, and inspiration to it. So, you know, just looking around my room, I've got, you know, 25 snare drums stacked up on this beautiful stand rack. Oh my God. It basically looks like a vintage drum store in here. I've got a heritage green, kind of think of like an old school Jaguar or an old school Porsche, kind of that military green color drum set behind me. So I'll just be looking around the room as a photographer and go like, oh, that's a really cool shot. And it, it just happens to be music stuff. So I post it online and people freak out. They're like, oh man, that's such a cool drum. Or what camera did you use? Or what drum head is that? And it just becomes all these questions. So visually I'll have an idea, but then I also kind of hear sounds in relationship to some imagery, you know? And so I'll, I'll get inspired, like right now, today I have a drum set up that I just kind of changed around with some really old drums from the uh, 40s. And they just sound different. So the sound of those drums gets you excited and inspired to play a certain way. But if I set up a real modern kit that's more rock and punchy kind of Foo Fighters drums, maybe I'll be inspired to do a cover of like a pop rock tune that's popular right now and put it on YouTube and see what people think. So every day is different. And I also play guitar and I play a little bit of keyboards and bass. So, you know, once in a while I'll come down here and I'll just play guitar or maybe I'll just take a couple of days off and I don't want to do anything and I'll maybe just take some photos outside. You know, it's just, and some days you don't want to do anything. You just want to relax and take your dog for a walk. These you know, breaks are just as important as, you know, being inspired in the moment. Sometimes you got to take a few days off to get that inspiration back. Ah, so you do take some days off every now and then. Okay. Well, the truth comes out. And I think there's something to be said for putting yourself in a creative environment and, and your studio ha has so many cool things and you clearly, impre you clearly appreciate the antiques or kind of vintage stuff as well. So you've, you've created this kind of monster of a setting for yourself. And then the other thing I was wondering about was in terms of drummers, like there's a, the vast majority of drummers, I'm sure kind of either teach themselves or get lessons early and then kind of play it as, as a hobby. But 
never get to the the professional level or or certainly like a Broadway level. What would you say is the difference? Like what can you point to that has made you have this you know stellar amount of success compared to somebody who's you know kind of fooling around the drums might be interested in having a career in drumming but for whatever reason has never got there? Yeah, that's a great question. I think my answer to that is just intention and the, the maybe the word drive comes into mind. You're anybody that's doing well in an industry, whatever industry it is, whether it's architecture, photography, business, whatever it is, those people aren't sitting around hoping their phone rings. You know, they're constantly, everybody that I've ever met in any industry, whatever it is, that's really good at it is passionate about it. Right. And they absolutely love it. They would be doing it whether they got paid or not. And so when you're that passionate about something, you, you don't really have a choice to not do it. And if you're going to do it that often, you're going to probably be meticulous about it. So then you just get up to the point where you're really good at your craft, right? So that's the first part. You have to be exceptionally good at what you do, whether you're one of the top architects in the world or the top musician in the world or top public speaker or teacher, whatever it is, whatever your gig is. Then now you're in a very, you've kind of weeded out the people that haven't practiced as much or, or worked on their craft as much. Now you're in a very small pool, but you're now you're having to compete with all these other people that are just as good, if not better than you. So you have to find out what your voice is on whatever your job is that makes you unique versus the other guy who might be technically just as good or better than you, but maybe his vibe is a little prickly or his aesthetic isn't as great and it doesn't connect with as many people. So that's something I'm still working on now that I feel like, you know, I'm always working on technique and always drums are very difficult instruments. So there's always stuff to work on. But beyond that, I'm, I'm trying to dig more into what my sound is and what people, when they say, oh, I can recognize your sound. The first two seconds I heard you play, I knew it was you. I'm trying to discover what that is. And that's a, it's almost an intangible thing. It's like, it's like your fingerprint, you know? So it's a yeah, hard yeah. thing to uh, kind of nail down. It's, um, and that's, that's what I think separates people from being just like, oh, I have a drum set and I play in a band once in a blue moon. We do a couple gigs a year and it's fun versus someone who's traveling around the world delivering clinics, you know, to people for, you know, 800 to 1,000 people in a room. I like the fingerprint analogy. And, and what you just said there is a couple parts. One is passion, which everybody knows, you know, you need passion, but obviously it needs to get to, you know, a certain level to actually have success at something. So you need that passion. But the other thing is identity. And I think, you know, you mentioned that you're still working on it, but I, I think everybody struggles on it to an extent is really getting clarity in narrowing down, like what makes you different? What can you focus on that you love doing, but also people can instantly identify you, even if it's, as you said, the first two seconds of a song in your case, that is really special. So I think that's a, a little magical formula that you've unveiled there. Yeah. And I just think one other thing I just want to kind of make sure people take away from this is, you, you know, you could be as talented as anybody, right? It could come naturally. You could have all this thing, but you have to have an intent. If you just kind of sit down at your job, whatever, whether it's music or design or being a doctor or a teacher, if you just go in and kind of know you can kind of coast through and it'll be fine, it's a very different thing than sitting down and having a very specific intent for how you want to do your job that day or in that moment. And if you're that focused, really good things come out of that, I've noticed. So that's another just side thing for people to think about. So let's get to a fan favorite segment called the Wild Business Shoutout of the Week. The Wild Business Shoutout of the Week! <laughs> wild Business Shoutout of the Week. Thank you. I know that's the best harmonica you've ever heard. This is where we talk about a recent brand or campaign that caught your attention. And uh, at the time of this recording, you know, the world is... There's so much going on with with COVID and and the you know the terrible virus that that the world is is battling right now and uh, some businesses as part of that have really done some incredible things to step up and and do things for the greater good. So you mind sharing some examples that you've seen from the the drumming world and the production side? Yeah, it's a crazy time for sure, and it's it's been really cool to see what the drum industry has done and. 
you know, I honestly was thinking about it when they were saying, you know, you have to shut down any non-essential businesses can't be working. And I was like, yeah, well, nobody's going to be making drums, obviously, but a few drum head manufacturers, if you picture a drum head, right, it's the, it's the piece of plastic that you actually end up hitting that goes on the drum. It's like a big pancake, you know, and they're usually clear plastic or frosted plastic. And one day somebody sent me this thing saying, man, these couple of drum head companies are actually open and they're making face shields. So if you picture like a circular piece of flat plastic, that's a drum head, let's say it's 14 or 16 inches wide, right? If you cut it a certain way, you can fold it to make a shield, like a face shield. So these companies are producing uh, face shields for doctors and anybody that's dealing with the virus, like in a hospital or medical situation. And they're cranking out thousands of these things a day. So I was really proud of those companies. And, and most of them I'm actually not even affiliated with, but I was like, man, that is a really smart way to use technology that they have the capability of making to help people. I mean, you never, that, a, a few of those are probably going to save someone's life, you know? So that's, yeah, that really was amazing to see that. It is. I love that example because I've, I've heard of the Fanatics example, the Fanatics, the company that, uh, I forget his name. I think Michael Rubin, the owner of the Sixers owns them as well. And they, you know, since baseball isn't happening as it normally would, they took uniform production and turned that into face masks as well. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, so that's happening in the the baseball production world. I had no idea it was happening in the drumhead production world as well. So these are, you touched on it, that kind of industries that aren't viewed as essential to begin with, and now they're doing essential things for the greater good and, and to just do whatever they can to help. So I really like those examples there. Yeah, just creative problem solving in a really difficult time. I mean, I didn't think about it, but I'm also not a drumhead manufacturer. But when I saw it, when the final product was on a person's face, I was like, man, that's a perfect application for this because they can make it as big as you want. And these were yeah. pretty big shields. So they were really going to cover you if any. Wow. Yeah, that's that's pretty crazy to think about. Yeah. So let's wrap up with some rapid fire Q&A. You ready for it? All right. I've had my coffee. Hit me. <laughs> there we go. That's the requirement. Let's get wild. What is your favorite bourbon of all time? Favorite bourbon of all time is from a company, Buffalo Trace, and it is their antique collection that comes out once a year in the fall, and it's probably tied. There's one called William LaRue Weller, and it's in a very tall, skinny bottle, and nearly impossible to find, and don't be fooled by, there is a, a cheaper version called William LaRue Weller in a short squat bottle you can find all over the place. It's not that one. It's the one that comes out in the fall. And if you find a bottle of it, it's probably $800. So good luck. Oh, my God. Well, you're just showing off your chops there. You clearly know bourbon. Oh, yeah. I got married. I Side note, uh, my wife and I got married at that distillery in Kentucky. So we're no way. pretty hard for it. Yeah. Buffalo Trace? Yep. Wow. That's, that's incredible. I need to check it out. Some of my friends have checked it out. We actually had a, a previous guest, Molly Pittman, who, believe it or not, she's a Facebook ads expert. But before she got into the Facebook ads world, she worked as a as a bartender and then also she worked at buffalo trace she's from kentucky so she worked in the bourbon world <laughs> so oh, no i can't way. believe you brought That's, that up yeah it's a great the people that work there are great when we rented the spot out they were nothing they were just amazing really great folks she might have been there who knows what is your second favorite bourbon no i'm just kidding <laughs> That's a whole other podcast. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, have you ever had an injury from drumming? No. Nope. Really? Okay, that's impressive. Just say the first one that comes to your mind. What is your favorite song, individual song to drum to? <sighs> Got to be any Led Zeppelin song. Oh, can't go wrong there. The 20-minute ones are like the four or five-minute ones. <laughs> any of them honestly i mean they're all amazing yeah i never get tired of listening to them and then what would be and you can't say broadway what would you say is like a a dream venue for you to perform at so it could be a stadium it could be could be a, a concert venue anywhere Where, where's one that you would absolutely love to perform at uh hands down madison square garden the garden oh yeah that's a classic and it would be with like you know playing with peter gabriel or or paul simon or something yeah that would that would be incredible 
I, I like it. And then what is your biggest pet peeve? Uh, people that are uh, late. Sorry, what was that? I'm just kidding. People that are late. That was a joke. Uh, what, no. <laughs> <laughs> what would you say is a quirk you have? So maybe it's something about your personality that makes you a bit unique and your wife has called you out on it or, or somebody's called you out on it, but it's, it's about your personality. It's, it's who you are. Well, I've got two. Uh, one of them is I'm, I'm a little OCD about organization. I'm very organized. If things are not where they're supposed to be, I'm either immediately putting them where they should be or telling the person that has put them where they're not supposed to be, hey, this is where this lives. Let's try to keep this orderly. And for me, <laughs> the life is so crazy and unpredictable and hectic that if I just know where all my stuff that I need is, that's one less thing I need to deal with to worry about. The second one is, and this is completely random, but I realized the other night, when I actually am laughing for real, like crying laughing, like hysterically laughing, I go absolutely silent and you'll just see tears coming out of the side of my eyes. No way. There's no sound and I'm just basically crying. I'm laughing so hard. That is a very unique and wonderful laugh. I, I thought I've heard some tears throughout this interview in the best way. So <laughs> that's cool. Appreciate you sharing that. Uh, on the organization or OCD front, I think I am exactly the same way. So it definitely resonates with me. And uh, my girlfriend, Dana, I'm sure could have a, a two hour podcast of, of her own about all the uh, things I have in that world. <laughs> oh, right. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's tough because most people aren't on that same page. You know, they just leave stuff wherever they want and then they can't find anything. Right. Yeah. There's definitely different mindsets about it. Well, Carter, this has been amazing. Thank you so much. Appreciate all your, your wisdom and gems. This has been an absolute joy and a long time coming. Where is the best place for people to connect with you and either watch or listen to your stuff or, or, or if they're interested in having a, a lesson from you? Uh, there's a lot of things. I'll just try to rapid fire this. So my Instagram is Carter at Carter Mac, C-A-R-T-E-R-M-A-C. That's kind of updated every day. I also have a YouTube channel. If you just type in Carter McLean search, my channel will pop right up. It's all drum stuff. I have a educational website called Four Hands Drumming. That's a yearly subscription. It's about 15 hours of education of all sorts of different things related to drums and music. Oh, and I also have a number one selling uh, drum book this year that won best uh, new drum book in Modern Drummer. It's called Concepts and Creativity. And that's from Hal Leonard Publishing. Wow. Well, congrats on that. So those are all great spots to catch you. We know that we can catch you on Broadway somewhere amidst the circle of life as well. And uh, for any Charlie Hunter fans out there, I know you've done a lot of work with Charlie Hunter as well. So plenty of places to catch you. But again, I just can't say enough of how much I enjoy your stuff. And for anybody interested in drumming or music in general, Carter is one of the most talented drummers and musicians out there. So I think anybody, even if they're not a huge music buff, would get a kick out of your videos and all the stuff you produce. So last thing here, the stage is yours. I know the stage is often yours, but final thoughts. It could be a quote. It could be a line. It could be a um, phone book drum solo, whatever you want. Send us off here. Oh, a phone book drum solo. You know what? I'll play. There, my drums are here. I'll play real quiet. I'll just play a little groove out. How's that? Oh, awesome. Yeah, that would be amazing. I'll do a real quiet. I'll use some mallets over here. Groovy, groovy, groovy. Thank you, Carter. You definitely have your mojo. And thank you, Wild listeners, for tuning in to another episode. If you want to hear more wild stories like this one, make sure to subscribe to this podcast on your favorite app and leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. You can also find us on Good Pods, where you can find all the podcasts your friends and family are listening to. In addition, you can dive into our marketing and business growth resources at hippodirect.com slash blog and hippodirect.com slash newsletter. That newsletter is the Hippo Digest, and it's your place for wild marketing ideas every single week.
And of course, come say hey on your favorite social media platforms at the handles Hippo Direct and Max Brandstetter. Until next time, let your business run wild. Bring on the bongos! Bongos!